Well, Shalom Church, and welcome to this session of Journey to Your Place of Grace, session three. We're going to look at some more exciting things about what the Bible has to say about our journey to our place of grace and about where that place is and what happens when we get there, how God will use us in some incredible ways. I want to review a little bit from last week. We finished talking about the idea of peace. What is peace? And you might remember we looked in John chapter 14. I'll put that on the screen for you, verses 24 to 27. And Jesus made this comment to his disciples. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Well, I love that verse, and I love that verse because the verse actually creates a question. He tells us he's going to give us peace, but then there's a question that remains afterwards because he talked about a different kind of peace other than that that he was going to give us. So if we stop and look at that verse real closely, we're going to recognize that there obviously are at least two kinds of peace in the world. And so what are they exactly? Well, when Jesus said he wanted to give us his peace, that tells us that there's probably something heavenly about it. There's something of a godly nature about his peace. And you might remember a little later on in the New Testament, the Bible tells us that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And so we talked a lot last week about this word shalom, which is the Hebrew word for peace, and how functionally what it means is to destroy the authority that establishes chaos in our life. Well, that's a very important thought, and I want to really drive it home with you before we move into the second half of this seminar, because the peace of Jesus, the shalom of Jesus, means that he comes to destroy the work of the enemy in our lives. Whatever it is that the enemy wants to do in our lives, Jesus came to destroy it. And when he was on the cross, you might remember, he said, it is finished. Therefore, there should be some finished nature about the work of Jesus as it applies to our lives. When it comes to this idea of destroying the work of Satan and providing us his peace. Now, he did talk about a peace that the world has. It's kind of interesting in that verse. He says this. He says, not as the world gives, I give to you. My peace, not as the world gives. So what is the peace of the world? Well, I, you know, everybody, I guess, has their own idea about that. I've come to a definition that works really well for me. I think the peace of the world is the lowest common denominator of chaos that everyone can agree to live with. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. When we have domestic situations where people make peace, but what they decide to do is, I'm not going to totally give in to your wishes. And the other person says, well, I'm not going to give in to totally to your wishes. And so we're going to discover some area here where we can agree to disagree. You've heard that term before. Well, that's not true peace because it doesn't last. It never lasts. The only peace that lasts is the peace that Jesus gives us. Now, it's very interesting when we talk about peace that we want to look for some other scriptures. You know, one of the things we do, the Bible is its own best commentary. So when we talk about something in the Bible, we want to always make sure that we have other scriptures to filter it through so that we know we have a balanced view of what the word of God is talking about. And so when it comes to peace in the scripture, we need to remember that admonition that if we want the peace of God, we've got to have peace with God. We can't have the peace of God until we've made peace with God. How do we do that? Well, the Bible calls that reconciliation. It calls it redemption. It calls it salvation. In other words, this process by which God says, I want to reconcile you. I want to redeem you from a life of sin and bring you back to my intention as it was with Adam in the garden. Now, remember, Adam was created in the image of God. And so we know that, that he was sinless. But something happened there, and because of that, you and I have to deal with this issue in our lives. That's called redemption. That's called salvation. And we reconcile with God, and when we do that, then we can have his peace. But not until we make peace with him. You see the difference in those two? And so Jesus talks about this, and it's very important as we move on in our seminar about talking about the grace of God, that we understand that his grace operates in a peace environment in a godly peace environment. And if we don't have that godly peace environment, it's going to be difficult for us to function properly in the place of grace that he has for us. Let's look at a good example of that. Anytime you have a question in the scripture, I always like to go back to Genesis because that's where all the themes in the Bible start, you might remember. In the first 11 chapters of Genesis, every theme of the Bible has its beginning. And so if you want to begin to study some particular theme, whether it's creation or whether it's salvation, whether it's God's plan for man, whatever it might be, 
it starts in the book of Genesis and generally right there in the first 11 chapters. And in the first 11 chapters, one of the first things we discover in Genesis 1 and 2 is God's creation. And he creates a very unique place. So as far as we know, the earth is the only place in all of God's creation that exists with the unique characteristics that we live in every day. In other words, there's an environment there's a beautiful creation. There's an earth that becomes a home for us, a place that we can exist in this physical nature. There are animals. There are just all kinds of things that God does not tell us he's done that anywhere else in all of his creation. Now, mankind is always searching for that because they're not satisfied with what God given us, I guess. But nonetheless, there's this search going on and, and no one has ever found a place like this anywhere in all of God's creation. And so because of that, we can take comfort in the fact that God has a very unique purpose for us in his eternal plans. And that's what we want to discover. So what does God do? I many times have asked the question, and I've pondered it a lot myself, because I like to, I like to answer some of these questions that give me the ability then to move forward through the scripture with a direction, with a purpose. And one of the questions I've asked myself, and I generally ask groups when I talk to them, is why did God create the heavens and the earth? In school, we learned these, this idea about always asking who, what, when, where, and how so that we can get the facts, get the details. And that's what a, that's what a reporter does, a newspaper reporter. In, I remember in school, we were taught that. This is the process that they go through. These are the parameters that they operate in so that they can discover the facts for a story. Well, I think for me, one of the most important facts in all of creation is why did God do this? Now, he's the only one that can answer that. You and I, you and I can't, you know, we don't know why God did this unless somehow in his word, he has revealed that to us. And once again, one of those scriptures that we're building our study on is, is found in Proverbs where Solomon says the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of Kings to search it out. And so I think that when we have a question like this, I think it's a good question. I think it's a godly question. I think it's a reasonable question. I think we ought to begin to try to search it out. And in, in my searching, I just want to tell you what I've discovered. I look at the first two or three chapters of Genesis, and I think there's a magnificent story there. I do not think that's two stories of two creations. I think that's different aspects of the same story of creation. And then you have chapter three where sin enters the picture. But in the process of that, I ask myself, well, God, why did you do this? And then he begins to describe what he did. But as you begin to dig into that, and especially if you'll learn the Hebrew alphabet so that you can kind of see what's going on in the structure of the words in those first several verses, one of the things I discovered was I believe that the answer to my question, why did God create the heavens and the earth, is just this. I believe he created a house, and that house originally was all of his creation, the heavens and the earth. Then it begins to compress down to where it becomes a garden, the Garden of Eden. And as we follow this, we begin to discover some really interesting things. And of course, you know that mankind is kicked out of the garden. And therefore, what becomes his home at that point? What becomes his house at that point? Well, he's kind of left to wander until God comes along and brings a, a unique structure, which he calls an ark, a boat. And all of a sudden, man's place to reside with God, the house that God has built, is an ark. And Noah and his family are in that ark for a period of time. They come out. And then if we'll continue to follow the story, we keep asking ourselves the question, well, where's the house now? And after the Tower of Babel, that God calls a man by the name of Abram out of a place that's identified as Ur of the Chaldeans. We know that that's modern day Iraq, the southern part of modern day Iraq. And he calls Abram to leave his home, leave his family and go to a place that he will be shown and that that will become a eternal inheritance for him and for his offspring. And so we follow the story of Abram. And where does he end up? He ends up in Canaan land, makes a sojourn down to Egypt, which, by the way, becomes an interesting part of the story. But now, all of a sudden, this family of Abram becomes literally the house of God on the earth. That's where God is communing with man. That's where he's working out his eternal plan for mankind. And so uh, Abram has children. He has Isaac. And Isaac becomes the son of promise. Isaac then has a son named Jacob. And you know the story, Jacob has 12 sons. Those 12 sons become the tribes of Israel. So at this point, the house is solidified into a nation that we identify as Israel. 
that God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And he said, because you wrestle with me, this is going to be your name. And then the whole nation takes on that name. So Israel functions and, and ends up in Egypt for 430 years. They have this incredible deliverance through the Red Sea. It starts at Passover, and it's the most miraculous thing in all of the Bible we find, that except for the resurrection itself, that God delivers them out of Egypt, and, and he takes them out into the wilderness for 40 years. Then he moves them into Canaan land, and he begins to build a nation out of them. Well, in the process of, of wandering out there, they build something called a tabernacle. God says, I, I want you to build a house where my presence will be. And so the tabernacle all of a sudden now has taken this, this place as the house that God is building. And that's where his presence, he says, I'll be in the cloud over the tabernacle. And so they experience that for 40 years. And then they move into Canaan land and they end up after a series of military conquests where they capture different parts of the land so that they can begin to call it their home and live there. They end up in a place called Shiloh. And in Shiloh, they spend the better part of 300 years and they take the tabernacle there and that becomes the seat of their worship, if you will. That tabernacle, in some form or fashion, lasted for virtually 300 years until David moves it to Jerusalem. And we know the story there that then that tabernacle evolves into a temple. Solomon builds a temple. And that temple was the focal point of Israel's communication with God, of their communing with God, all the way up until Christ comes. And when he comes, things begin to change rapidly. And of course, you'll know that that in AD 70, some, some 35 or 40 years after he was crucified, the temple's destroyed and it no, longer, it no longer plays a part in God's place with man. But the apostle Paul straightens that out for us and he says, well, we've still got a house. We've still got a house. Don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And so what's God done? He, he has this whole history of several millennia where he says, I'm going to create a house, and that house begins to evolve, but the purpose in that house is always to be a place where man can commune with God. That's okay. Well, there's our first step to why God did this. And so he built a house. Well, once you have a house, what do you need? You need a resident. And so God built a house to put mankind in. He started with Adam. Mr. and Mrs. Adam later became Adam and Eve because she became the mother of all living. And then we have these generations that began to pass on. And the, and the Bible recounts much of that story, not of all of the nations, but particularly of the lineage that God is going to follow through the entire story of the scripture to bring us to a place where he can reconcile us. Remember, that was our objective to find his peace. So we've got a house. And we've got a resident, man. So God built a house to put mankind in. Why did he do that? What's the objective here? Well, we find beginning right there in the book of Genesis, the very first two chapters, that God makes a covenant with Adam. And then as we continue to study the scripture, we, de we determine that God's relationship with man becomes covenantal. In other words, he makes a series of covenants throughout the history of his relationship with man. And we now live under a covenant called the New Testament. And that covenant, it was all brought about by the sacrifice, the execution of Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God on a cross called Calvary in the land of Canaan in Jerusalem, which we now call modern day Israel. And as he died on the cross, the story is explicitly clear. He died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven, not just covered over as they did when they had all of this sacrificial system with the blood of animals, but totally forgiven because the sacrifice now was a human man called Jesus Christ who was also fully God, and therefore he was sinless. And so we have now a sinless sacrifice that's been made for our sins. What a story. What an incredible story. And so if you look at the panorama of the Bible, the entire story from Genesis to now, it tells a very specific journey that God has brought mankind on to bring us to a place where he could be reconciled with us. Now, it raises a lot of other questions if you'll begin to contemplate that, such as, well, why did he let evil come in in the first place? You know, what's all this business about the devil? Uh, he's not equal to God. He's not equal to Jesus. Why did God give him the authority that he gave him? All of those questions, many of which I firmly believe we're going to have to save until we get to, until we get to heaven, until we get to glory. But we've been given many answers along the way. And as we talked about this at our, at our study last Wednesday, I, I love the answer that one young lady gave. She said, well, it's simple, yeah, so that we could know God's love. 
And I think that's one of the deepest answers that we're ever going to find in all of Scripture, in all of our relationship with God. He did everything he did so that we could comprehend how much he loves us. That's just, isn't that incredible? It's just absolutely incredible. So I want to show you on the screen this series of gardens. I have a, I have a picture here that someone's painted themselves, which looks like a maybe an idea of what the Garden of Eden may have looked like. But by the same token, I think the Garden of Eden was probably a little more than we than we have given it credit for being. I, you see here a, a garden that's out in somebody's backyard and they're out there tending and trying to pick the okra and pick the tomatoes and, and the beans and all these kinds of things. I do not think that that is what the Garden of Eden was all about. I, I know it was there for food because as we read the text, God says, you've got everything here you need. It's all yours. But then the story goes on a little further and God gives Adam some specific instructions about the garden. And so I think the garden was a gorgeous place, a beautiful place. I think it was full of peace. There was obviously no sin in the garden. There, in fact, there was no death in the garden. So everything just continued to, to live and blossom and bloom. And so there wouldn't have been a need to replant things and, and, and to take out old bushes when they had died and things. So, so we have to ask ourselves, well, what exactly was Adam doing in the garden? Many of you may be familiar with the, this idea of European gardens, where in, in Europe in, during a certain period of time, and there's still a lot there now, they built these magnificent areas of lush, lush vegetation where people could just gather and visit and find a place of solace, a place of peace. The picture on your screen is actually in Israel. It's in Haffa, Israel. And on the first trip that Claudia and I took to Israel, we, we went by this place. We saw this scene. And that is the University of Baha'i, I think they call it. But they have built this beautiful garden setting that you can walk out in and, and just relax and meditate, do, you know, do whatever. I think the Garden of Eden was something that we've probably never really contemplated before. Let's read the text and see where it takes us. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17 says this, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And so God puts Adam and Eve in this garden. He says, hey, Everything here is for you to enjoy. You don't have to work. You know, we're going to talk about these words in a minute, but he says you can eat of anything here except two trees. And if you eat of those two trees, then there's going to be a penalty for that. A Bible study one morning, years, several years back, and someone was reading this verse. It was a men's group on a Saturday morning. And, and as they came to the last portion of this verse where God says, you shall surely die, the thought struck me. I'd been studying a little bit through Genesis, just trying to understand it better. And the thought occurred to me, Adam didn't die for at least 900 years after this. So is that, is that what God was alluding to, that you're going to physically die? So I began to do one of those things that I encourage everyone to do is find those things that God has concealed in the scripture and let him reveal them to us as we dig and as we study and as we ask him questions. So I went back to this verse and as you can see, I've underlined five words. I've underlined garden, Eden, tend, keep, and die. As I read through this, this particular scripture, those stood out to me, and I thought, well, maybe if I could study those words. I'll just do a word study on each of those words and see what God will reveal to me. So I began to do that, and I discovered something very interesting. In Hebrew, the word garden is gone. It's a two-letter word as we, as we translated or transliterated into English, gimel and anun. And as you look at the function of the letters of those words, as they were originally depicted in, in the ancient Hebrew language, you discover that the, the function of a garden is it was a gathering place for life. Well, if you'll think about these ideas of these European type gardens, these gardens where you go just to gather and to enjoy nature, yeah, that fits. That's, that's a good description of a garden. Well, how about the idea of Eden? Actually, if we pronounce that properly, it would be closer, I think, to Eden. And as we break that word down and say, well, what's the function of this word as we look at it in ancient Hebrew? And the function of that word turns out to be not only is it a gathering place for life, a garden, but it's a gathering place for the journey of life, to learn the journey of life. 
I thought, well, now that's interesting. If, if that was God's intent when he made this garden to create a place, he knows that, that he's going to have more people because what does he tell Adam and Eve? He says, be fruitful and multiply and take dominion. Well, that must mean that God's putting them in a situation where, A, they can be fruitful and multiply, which would result in other generations of human beings coming along, and B, that he wants them somehow to be able to pass on the knowledge for the journey of life. Well, I believe the Garden of Eden was designed to do that in some form or fashion. Now, we can't go back to it. God has hidden it from us after the flood. We have no idea where it was. I mean, we've got some areas that we think it might have been in, but it's not like we're going to go back and do an archaeological dig and find this garden. That's past, so we've got to take what God gives us. So let's move on to the next step. He gives Adam instructions. He says, I want you to tend and keep this garden. Now, you and I automatically, when we hear that in English rendition of those Hebrew words, we think, well, yeah, you know, Adam's supposed to go out there and he's supposed to take his hoe and his rake and he's supposed to go out and cultivate. He's supposed to plant some seeds, but there's no indication in the scripture that that was the task that Adam was given. As a matter of fact, I contend that if we look at those words, we discover something interesting And I believe Adam's assignment to tend and to keep in the garden, which was a gathering place for life, where the knowledge for the journey of life was located, I believe his assignment was administrative and not agricultural. Now, let me explain that. I don't think that Adam or coveralls had a little John Deere tractor or lawnmower that he rode on, all these tools and implements. I think that Adam's responsibility was to administrate what went on in this garden and that his future generations were to use this garden. This is a, this is a, a ground zero, if you will. This is, this is central where they would come back and Adam would have the wisdom and the knowledge for the journey of life. Well, we know that Adam was extremely intelligent because we've already found out that God has allowed him to name every animal. And by the way, that was just not a, well, I'm going to call that one a lizard and I'm going to call that one a bird. No, Hebrew names are always given according to character. We we see that in the Bible. People are not named in ancient times in, in that part of the world, in those cultures, until they found out what their character was going to be. And so time and time again, we see names in the Old Testament. And we think, well, that, yeah, that person acts that way if we look at the meaning of the name. And so I believe the same thing applies to the animals. And, and when Adam named them, he knew their character. Now, the Bible indicates that this all took place within a day's time. And if that's the case, then Adam, first of all, had to be incredibly intelligent. And this all had to happen in a, you know, we would say in light speed, because all of the animals, the different kinds of animals were passed before Adam. And now we might say, well, you know, that's, that's physically impossible. That can't be done until we go back to that next story that we like to land on about a guy by the name of Noah who built an ark. And in the ark, he took two of every kind of animal. Well, you know, we now know that that's possible. Different engineers have told us that it's possible to build a boat that can hold two of every kind of animal. Now they they didn't, let's just talk about dogs. They didn't take chihuahuas and German shepherds and schnauzers and all those, all that kind of thing. They took two dogs, two dogs of the kind. And after that, they've had all these years now to to evolve. That's what evolution is. It's simply the the evolving, the changing of a kind. But no dog ever became a reptile. You see, that doesn't happen. We don't, they don't move from one kind to another. And we now know modern engineering and information has told us that it was very possible for Noah to build an ark where he could take two of each kind of animal. First of all, he took juveniles. He took the small ones. We know that because their job was to grow up and have more after they after they got there. So why take an, an old elephant with you? You take, a, you take a juvenile. And so because of all that, we know that Adam only had to name the kinds to start with. And so, A, that's possible. So all of a sudden here, we have Adam in the garden. And I believe his job, and I believe he was totally equipped for this, was to administrate God's plan for mankind. That's why it's so important when we get to the story of sin that we recognize that the objective of Satan 
was not so much to destroy this idea of a beautiful place to live and and all of, all of that kind of thing, but it was to destroy God's plan for his relationship with mankind. Now, we know that that was done because of pride and because of jealousy. The Bible tells us very clearly that Satan, Lucifer, was jealous and he wanted to be like God. But God had a special relationship with mankind that he didn't have with his created angels, his created spiritual beings. All right, so here's what happens. God says, if you disobey me and eat of those two trees I've told you not to eat of, then you're going to die. The word die in the scripture is the word muth. And muth is a very interesting word. It's in the scripture. If you'll do a word study on it, sure enough, you're going to find that it is associated with physical death over and over and over again. However, if you go back to the original use, the first mention of this, of this word in the scripture, you'll discover some interesting things. The first thing is you'll discover that Adam lived for some 900 years after this. So he didn't immediately physically die. I contend that he died because of what Muth actually talks about. Secondly, you'll discover, if you go to a Hebrew Bible, that the word is repeated. Now, God does not stutter. And when he repeats a word in Scripture, he has a reason for it. And so he tells Adam, he said, if you disobey me, you're going to Muth, Muth. So let's look at this word, Muth. I believe that it talks about a, a function not so much that deals with physical death. I think physical death is a result of, of the function that it's talking about. I believe Muth speaks of attaching chaos to the covenant God made with Adam. Back to our original question of why did God do this? He wanted to have a covenant relationship with mankind. Well, when Adam disobeyed, that brought chaos into that covenantal relationship. And we say it so many times, we're all born now, you and I, each one of us is born with a sinful nature. Well, yes, we're born with that chaos of disobedience attached to the covenant desire God has for our lives. And he's given us a way to reconcile that. Well, why is the word repeated? I think that's an interesting thing too. It's translated in kind of a, a strange way. When you read your English Bible, it will say, you shall surely die. The first, you shall surely, is the first word, muth, and die is the second word, muth. Now, you know, why they translate it that way, I'm, I'm sure they had great deep discussions about this, but I believe it also indicates, in addition to anything else it might indicate, I believe it indicates that, first of all, Adam is going to have chaos attached to the covenant God has with him. And secondly, Adam is the representative of all mankind. Remember, that's why God puts him in the garden in the first place. You represent me and you tell the rest of the population that's coming on this earth that I have created what it means to take a journey in life with me. And so I believe as the representative for all mankind, God is not only saying there's going to be chaos attached to my covenant with you, Adam, but because of your representation, because of your place in this, there's going to be chaos attached to the covenant I have with all of mankind. And again, our proof for that is, is uh, the fact that we're born dead in our trespasses and sins. I mean, Paul explains it to us in the New Testament. So we have this incredible picture as we move through the first two chapters of Genesis about this garden. Now, there's some clarification. Always remember that the Bible is its own best commentary. So there's clarification of what's going on here in the New Testament. Let's go to that clarification. And it's found, interestingly enough, in the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Everyone's familiar with that chapter, at least for one verse. What's the world's most famous verse? Yeah, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should have eternal life. Well, that's one verse in, in that entire chapter. And that chapter is a conversation that Jesus is having with a religious leader of Israel named Nicodemus. He's a Pharisee and he's been observing what Jesus is doing and teaching. And he comes to Jesus by night. He does that because he, he wants to slip in kind of stealth and talk to Jesus and try to get some answers about all this, but he doesn't want anybody to know he's doing it. And so that means that he's kind of straddling the fence here. He's, got, he's, he's confused, but he thinks there's something there he needs to know. He needs to understand. Have you ever kind of been in one of those places? So Nicodemus visits Jesus in John chapter three, and Jesus begins to explain to him. He, he says, you know, Jesus, what's this you're talking about? You've got to be born again or born anew or born from above. That's translated different ways in, in different versions 
of, of the Bible. And as is his custom, Jesus answers Nicodemus in a rather interesting way. He says, well, Nicodemus, you're a, you're a spiritual leader of Israel and you don't understand these things. And so as the, as the conversation unfolds, we now have John 3.16. We have John 3.17, by the way, which also tells us that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but through him the world might be saved. So that sheds some light on our original story. Why is there a need for salvation? There's a need for salvation because chaos was attached to the covenant that mankind has with God. And salvation is the remedy for that. So we're going to learn some very interesting things. First of all, physical birth must precede spiritual birth or birth from above. In other words, we got to have a physical life before we can have a need for a spiritual life. So let's see how that works. When Jesus had this conversation with Nicodemus, he said, look, your physical birth has to precede the spiritual birth, but physical birth does not include the spiritual birth. Now, here's a, here's a kind of a catching point that we need to think about. We need to fully understand. And that is that when we're born physically, we're born a full human being, just as God intended. However, there's a problem in our relationship with God that he calls death. Remember the apostle Paul said in the book of Ephesians, while we were still dead in our trespasses and sins. So we're really only partially born, if you will. We're born a, a physical body and that grows up. We know how that works. We, we have to deal with the, the physical reality of living in this physical world. We have a soul. We have a mind, a will, an intellect, an emotion. All of us, we learn things. We know when we're, when we're growing up young, if we touch the burner on that stove when it's on, it's going to be hot and that's going to hurt. That's part of our soul process. But Jesus is alluding to something else. Something has to be born anew. What is that? Well, I contend that that's our spirit man and that that spirit man is the part of us that communes with God. Now, what's the, what's the textual context for that in the Bible? Well, what did God do? He put Adam out of the garden. Prior to that, Adam and Eve were in the garden, and the Bible reports to us that, that God would visit them in the cool of the day, and he would walk and talk with them. They communed. They had a relationship together. When he puts Adam out of the garden, mankind out of the garden, what does he do? Well, he, put, he tells them there's going to be a curse involved now, and he tells Eve, he says, first of all, you're going to have a lot of pain in childbirth. Well, we have discovered, uh, the ladies, that that's true. And I'm going to take your word for it. I, I, I know that it's a painful process. Secondly, he says, and your desire is going to be for your husband. Isn't it interesting as we look at our culture, which is trying to become its own God, we like to, we like to take this idea of humanism that I'm my own God. I'll decide what's right and what's wrong and how I want to go about it. And by the way, when I make my decision, you have to follow my decree. I mean, that's a, there's a lot of that going on in our culture. And we discover when that happens that, that all of a sudden this, this chaos that we have attached to our life just begins to grow and, and to flourish. Well, that's part of what goes on in our soul. The spirit thing is a little bit different, and we've talked about that the last couple of weeks. The Apostle Paul clarifies a lot of it in the book of 1 Corinthians when he talks about this idea of the natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit. They're foreign to him. Therefore, there has to be a, a birthing of the spiritual man so that we can understand, so that we can communicate with God. And that's why a lot of people read scripture and they say, well, I, I just don't understand this. It's because one, either they're not born again, or two, they've been born again, but they're not maturing, and there's still some more of that process to go on so that that understanding can develop. That's a natural thing. Paul talks to the Galatians about that. He says, you know, you, you, you're not supposed to live on milk forever. You got to move on to meat. Well, that's a physical example of a spiritual truth. And, and so it's, it's just really good for us to understand. That. And that's why we have studies like the one we're doing right now. Well, let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter two, and let's see what the apostle Paul says about these concepts. He says, but God, by the way, always, 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 anytime you're reading the apostle Paul, if he says, if, and, but, therefore, whatsoever, stop, slow down, because you're fixing to get something that's really good. He's, he's going to give you something that's really got a lot of bite to it. And you need to, you need to take it all in. He says, but God, and so if we want to know what God does here. He says, God, first of all, he's rich in mercy. Don't, aren't you happy about that? God's rich in mercy. If God wasn't merciful, you and I wouldn't get the next breath. You see, that's his mercy and it covers all of his works. We're going to talk about that later on in our study. Because of his great love with which he loved us, 
Even when we were, here's what I've been alluding to, dead in trespasses, what did God do? He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Now, what did that just tell us? That tells us that we're dead in trespasses and sins. That's the condition we're born in. But God knew that there was a way to reconcile that, to fix that, to correct that. And so what is that way? He makes us alive when we're together with Christ. If we're not together with Christ, then there's no solution to our death and our trespasses and sins. And by the way, he ties that to this idea of grace. And that's going to be very interesting as we continue our study. And it says, he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, this is one of those this is one of those verses that Paul was alluding to when he says, the mind of natural man can't understand the things of the spirit. What he's telling us here in the book of Ephesians is that at the same time we're having this study, we're doing it in an earthly setting, whether you're live in a study or whether you're looking at it by video, you know, this modern technology that we have. At the same time, if we're in Christ, if we're enjoying our salvation, if if we have said yes to Jesus Christ and his blood has been appropriated towards our sin, then somehow we're seated in heavenly places. Well, I contend that the only way we can benefit from that kind of a relationship is in a spiritual setting. We can't, you know, physically, we, you know, we're, we're still here on the earth. But he tells us we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. He goes on to say this, there's a reason for it. The God has done this for a reason. Well, you ever want to know why God did all this? Here's another part of the answer to our question, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, this is one of those places that that I contend that there's more to God's grace than just unmerited favor. Because, I, I mean, God can just, he can show in the ages to come that he forgave us and that he's going to go ahead and let us come to heaven anyway. But I think there's much more to it, you see, because he wanted a relationship where he had a covenant setting with man. And so that's a two-way deal. It's not just that we got saved and therefore we're going to heaven. So let's continue to see what God says about this. Remember, Jesus, Yeshua, as his mother called him, had this visit from Nicodemus. He says physical birth must precede spiritual birth or birth from above. Physical birth does not include spiritual birth. That's Ephesians chapter 2, 5. And then he goes on to say this, grace is the birthing agent. We've been saved by grace. And what has happened when we've saved by grace? I would contend that it's going to lead to identifiable results. In other words, when we get saved, something has to show. There's got to be some fruit from our salvation. Jesus said that. He said, you judge a tree by its fruit. So if we don't have fruit of our salvation, if something doesn't happen in our life that that changes us from having a, a unction toward the ungodly to having a desire for the godly, and also to having a lifestyle that comes from godliness, then we have to ask ourselves the question, have we been saved? And if not, we need to deal with that. There's, there's a way to deal with that. Let's go on to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. This is Paul writing to uh, the Corinthian church, and there's a guy there by the name of Titus. It's one of Paul's disciples, and he has a message for him. He says, so we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. Now, Titus is not the one that's bringing unmerited favor to the Corinthians. God's the one that's giving the favor. Titus is simply bringing some kind of a message. Well, his bringing of the message is a grace that Paul is referring to. So there's some ability, there's some empowerment that Titus has in this situation to carry this message of grace, to to bring about this idea, this concept of grace in the lives of those that are listening. He said, but as you abound in everything, listen to this, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us. So listen, if we want to be abounding in uh, in God's things, here's a pretty good outline for us. We need to have faith. We need to watch our words. Remember, what does the Bible tell us? It says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So listen to what you say. That'll tell you what your heart's thinking. And by the way, not just when you're at church. <laughs> we got to listen 24-7. 
because those things that come out of our mouth when we're not in the presence of God's people are what are the things that are down deep in our heart. And that's what needs to be dealt with. In knowledge, that's what we're doing right now. We're gaining knowledge about what God's will for our lives is. In diligence, we need to be diligent about what we do. We can't just hit and miss. Can't just get with God's people every once in a while. And if I've got something that's more important, like a like an athletic event or or, uh, you know, a, a get together with the guys or the gals or a weekend, you know, where we're just, well, those things we have to ask ourselves, what is our highest priority? And our highest priority, quite frankly, shows in our lifestyle and in your love for us. And there he's talking about the way they support him. There's, there's no doubt about that. He, but he gives them this admonition. He says, see that you abound in this grace also. Well, what is this grace? Well, it's the bringing and enacting of this message of God's plan to people because that's what Titus was doing. That's been identified as Titus's gracing. And now he's telling them, you've got all these tools to work with. You're supposed to be gracing others also. So this is a, this is a perpetual thing. It just continues to multiply itself. So this is pretty good. This is pretty good advice for us. So what's the solution? Well, quite simply, the solution is to detach the chaos from our covenant and reconcile with God and then live a godly lifestyle so that the chaos doesn't keep coming back and trying to reattach again. And the process to do that is called redemption. Now, I know that that's a big Bible word, and we're going to look a little deeper into what redemption means, redeem, and what the actual concept behind it is. But what happens is when we're redeemed, when we go through this process of redemption with God, he buys us back, as it were, into his total possession, then the process is grace. We're now in a state of grace. And that's what we want to ask. What is that? This word redeem is very interesting. It's the word gaal in Hebrew. And it simply means to roll back. It, it means to take something back. The root word is, is goal. And goal would be the idea of a, if a rock rolled down it, and you wanted it back in its original place to roll it back up. Well, that's where the idea of redemption comes from. God doesn't want us in the place that we roll to that's sin infested. He wants us back in the original place that he designed us for. And the picture of that's the Garden of Eden. And so this idea of redemption is very important to us. And so God wants to gather us with great authority back into his fold. And that's why we have all these pictures of shepherds and sheep and all these different things. Isn't that great? Well, we're going to move now. We're going to start moving now a little deeper into our idea of what is grace. And grace in the Hebrew is the word chen. And by the way, in the, in the New Testament, in the Greek version, it's the word charis. And how is that generally translated? Well, it's translated as gifts or grace. There's different terms, but it's the same Greek word. When Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, we look in Romans chapter 12, we look in Ephesians chapter 4, all these places that we find gifts, those are grace, that's charis. And in the Old Testament, it's called chen. Noah found chen in the face of the Lord. In other words, God gave him favor, gave him grace. What was that? What happened there? And so we want to look at that. And and as we do, we're going to find that the function of this is all built around the idea of offense and life. And the idea of offense is that God is going to give us an assigned area where he's going to enhance our life to do what he's called us to do and to be who he created us to be. And the interesting thing is we're going to find in no uncertain terms that God has obligated himself to provide everything we need to do that. He doesn't say, well, here's your assignment, go get it done. That's why the parables of the talents are so important in the New Testament. He says, no, I'm going to provide the talents. I'm going to provide the charis for you to do this. And here's what I want you to do in this defined area of life. And so we're going to find out what that defined area is, how we're supposed to function in it, and how God has equipped us to do that. And as we move on, That's going to be where we're going to find ourselves in session four of Journey to Your Place of Grace. Now, I want to remind you at the end of this session of of one scripture. I keep going over these because I want them to become part of your spirit, man. I want you to, these to be natural and and ready all the time for you. In uh, Corinthians chapter two, verses 14 and 15, I've already alluded to it in this teaching. Paul says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. I want you to be able to spiritually discern the things of God. 
I want me to be able to do that. I think that should be the objective for all of us. And that's uh, what this study is all about. We want to know the things of God that he has given us the ability to spiritually understand and discern about this idea of grace. And we'll continue next week in session four on your journey to your place of grace. Until then, may God bless you.